Hello everyone, welcome to Meta Italia. Uh, this is our YouTube channel. We are the Italian party of DM25. And today we are speaking English again because we have two guests from the US um, from the show Left Reckoning, which you should all watch. Um, it's really great and coherent and um, I think the kind of media we need. Uh, they are David Griscom and Matt Legg. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here today. Glad to be here. Yeah, seriously, thank you. So um, we're going to start talking about um, the topic that we got you guys on for. Uh, basically, we were really interested in finding out what the what you guys believe the role of the United States is um, in what's happening in Palestine, uh, specifically in Gaza. And we don't just want to talk about what happened after um, October, the, in October 2023, um, but we also want to put it into context and see how far back the U.S. involvement in the so-called conflict uh, goes. And yeah, basically, this is the main topic that we want to discuss. Then we, would we will obviously look at the role of the European Union as well as a United States partner. And so let me start with the first question. Um, what do you believe is the role of the European Union as a United States partner in regards to the ongoing situation in Gaza. So specifically, um, you know, the role in this more recent, um, you know, attack on the on the on Gaza, basically. But also, if you can go a bit back, uh, like I said, kind of historically, where does the, the link come from between the, the United States and the European Union? Yeah, you know, I mean, to start with, um, definitely, like, Israel as a colonial project, this is just a matter of fact, um, uh, structure that it was created as even by the founders, they understood that they needed a, uh, a colonial sponsorship, whether from England or, or from the US. So, you know, like, the question is, what should there be? I I'll back it up, like, I'm someone who who arose to political consciousness, really in the in the wake of the Iraq war. And in that context, uh, I looked at Europe as sort of like a conscience. Uh, they weren't as into the Iraq war as America was, and they could tell us, you know, we had big reactions against France. And so we renamed French fries, freedom fries. And, you know, one thing I realized in here is that's not particularly the case. Uh, you know, we have, and, and it's hard, it's different, you know, based on which country, obviously Europe is, is a big uh, place, but there are certain countries that I wouldn't want to take, uh, particularly from the political leadership, um, uh, any any sort of guidance on this issue, particularly Germany, I think seems particularly lost, given that this is um, uh, in a, a large part uh, tied to their history and their inability to grapple with it. Uh, so, you know, it, I, I'm curious what David has to say, but that's one of the things here is like um, how I think the leaders in, in Europe see their role is to be a supporter of the Zionist project in one of its bloodiest moments. Yeah, and I mean, you know, just piggybacking off of that, um, I totally agree with what Matt's saying there. And, um, you know, I mean, on, on, on a kind of like individual level, it's been really difficult hearing from some of our friends and comrades, uh, particularly in Germany, um, who are doing advocacy and work uh, for Palestinian human rights going up um, against, you know, direct threats to employment and, and things like that, um, getting in trouble with the government. I mean, that kind of stuff is extremely worrying. And like, not to sit here and say that America um, is, you know, beautiful in that regard. I mean, you know, a lot of people have been getting fired um, and, and attacked. Hell, here in Austin, Texas, we just had a violent attack um, from, a, you know, a racial attack on a Palestinian American who was at a rally here. Um, but I think as as Matt was sort of saying, seeing the, the reality of the European situation, um, you know, is, is truly worrying. But talking more about, you know, the, the European Union, I mean, um, you know, what should the European Union be doing if we had, you know, smart people in power, uh, ethical people in power? Um, it would be putting pressure, uh, 
not just on Israel, but on the United States. Um, you know, the, the United States is doing a, a, so much work right now uh, to protect uh, this brutal onslaught against the people of Gaza. Um, it's done that historically, as, as I think most people listening to this already know. Um, and, you know, this ability of, of, of America to basically shut down the international community, right, be it places like the United Nations, um, or just, you know, direct usage of, of soft power um, against or hard power against other nations. Um, you know, this is something where, you know, I think seeing some of the mobilizations from, uh, you know, leaders in like, let's call it the global south, people like Lula, um, has been truly inspiring, and I think really important. I don't think, you know, it's, it should be lost on anybody how significant it is that South Africa um, was the ones, you know, trying um, Israel for this attempted genocide. Um, you know, so I think there's an opening um, for, you know, nations in the global south. And I think the European Union, if it had ethical, democratic uh, leadership, uh, would be joining that side instead of sort of, yes. you know, sort of being a little hesitant about going as far as maybe some of the leaders of America um, are willing to go. Uh, but, you know, certainly not playing the role that I think it could and should be playing here. Oh, I, yeah. It's, I think it's very dire. We had Chip Gibbons of Defending Rights and Dissent on recently, and you look at the withdrawal of the funding for uh, uh, UNRWA in the wake of the ICJ mm. ruling is, you know, that seemed like uh, Europe and America, um, like all deciding we're actually this uh, this further opportunity given to us by South Africa in that case, we're actually going to go in the direct opposite direction and even make ourselves more directly and outwardly complicit. I, it, it's a really dark, I think, uh, fork in the road that uh, we took following the ICJ thing and uh, and the countries uh, within um, Europe, like um, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, Latvia, Netherlands, Romania, Sweden. I mean, Iceland, like these, this is this is a big stain on I think those countries um, uh, to, for withdrawing um, funding on such flimsy premises and such I think transparently propagandistic uh, premises. Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, adding to that, what is the relevance of the United States? Uh, compared to Israel and other kind of Israeli allies uh, in the situation in Gaza right now. So what's the difference between, say, the United States versus any other ally? Uh, do you guys think the U.S. has a kind of special uh, role in this? Well, you're, you're quiet. Yeah. Um, you know, you get a lot of people making a supposition that, you know, Biden is only so powerful and there's only so much that he could do. Uh, and to me, that conversation amounts to a, a waste of time that's pretty much blatantly dishonest. Any historian, the historians that I read, uh, like Abby Schlame, uh, 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 Tom Segev, I believe, with regard to the 1967 war, they very clearly say, yeah, the, they're checking America's pulse on these matters constantly. And with regards to like the occupation or with regards to launching strikes in 67, like Israel has always, America has always played a major role in, uh, if not green lighting, uh, very um, studiously yellow lighting uh, certain activities. And I haven't seen any sort of evidence that that has changed. The only thing that I've seen change with Biden is that he's been less willing than even Republicans like Reagan uh, or uh, Bush Jr. or Bush Sr. Um, uh, to say, hey, maybe cool it on the retaliation that you're doing here. Uh, uh, you know, he's been doing basically nothing. Um, and and I think that the key thing way you know that what America says matters is um, Anthony Blinken uh, immediately after uh, uh, October 9th uh, said, you know, I agree with Turkey that we should be calling for a ceasefire uh, to secure the release of hostages. And he deleted the tweet because it included the word ceasefire. And if that didn't matter, I don't think he would have bothered deleting it. But I think very clearly, like the, and what matters the most, and you hear this straight from the leaders of Israel is uh munitions is is uh is 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 yeah weapons so um you know <laughs> the idea that there's nothing like america is very very relevant when it comes to uh what's going on here and it's crazy that we are making these 
uh, pronouncements that we are so concerned about loss of life as we give billions of dollars of military aid to the country. It's 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 horrible. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, in addition to to that, I think, um, you know, sometimes, uh, and I think we'll get into this maybe a little bit later. Uh, you know, you look at uh, the kind of opinion polling on 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 what Israel is doing right now to Gaza. I mean, it's not something um, that is you know popular with most Americans. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a full gradient of like how people feel about it politically here, um, but uh, there's a big disconnect. I think between like the average American and 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 what are, what our policy is, so you just start to wonder like why does America you know sort of play the role that it does? Um, you know, I think you know historically the kind of old argument our understanding used to go that like Israel was seen as a kind of bulwark against like Pan Arabism um, or the Soviet Union. Um, obviously, you know that no longer being uh, you know something that is. Uh, you know, threat, um, you know, what is it about Israel, um, you know, that that's so interesting to the United States? And you could go down a bunch of rabbit holes talking about culture and, and politics in America, uh, which I'm happy to do. Um, but I think that what Matt was saying, um, I think really does show why a lot of powerful people are interested in it. Um, and it's that, you know, this is some, uh, 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 this is a country um, that has a very deep connection, for example, with the American military industrial complex. Um, and also, let's not forget that there's also relationships, these things go vice versa, Um with uh, you know the United States military being very uh, very interested in Israeli military technology, I mean Israeli military techniques, right? Um, so having a kind of you know you know to to use a kind of crass term like testing ground for some of these things, um, you know is uh, you know is something that it's very clear that America and uh, pe there's an interest from some people in America uh, to see that kind of relationship and 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 this conflict to continue in 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 in, in some way or the other, um, you know. So there's there's a lot. Of uh, I think, uh, you know, and the, the uniqueness of America, I think also in its ability to sort of put pressure on attempts uh, to see justice being done for for Palestinians. I'm just trying to stop attempts to, to, to pursue justice for Palestinians. Um, you know, I mean, America does not play a small role at all in, in, in this conflict. And, um, you know, it's not something that just started on October 7th. Yeah, um, exactly. It isn't. And so we wanted to kind of expand a little bit on that and expand a little bit on your point about, um, you know, the who is interested in this, right? Like, for example, that connection with the military industrial complex. Um, that's just an example, but basically why is this happening? Why has this been happening since basically 1948 um who's actually interested in this because there is this huge uh misleading kind of idea that is sold to people which is that this is a conflict uh, it's not mm -hmm. between yeah. two peoples that can't under understand each other it's two religions that's the problem that's to to a materialist that's clearly not the problem right um and it isn't West versus uh, East, or it's not even that. Um, so we were wondering, what do you guys think are these huge material interests uh, that keep this apartheid state going? Um, and yeah, what's the the role of the United States? Are we like should we talking? Uh, about this, uh, the the United States complicity in terms of a nation, or by doing that, are we kind of failing to point the finger uh, more specifically at the American uh, capitalist class? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, Rashid Khalidi's work, Hundred Years War on Palestine, goes into the financial. Like, the Palestinians weren't just dispossessed in in you know, violent conflict. It was often, and it wasn't like a, a like the mythical settler colonial, we, we experience it here in America too, that we are better at improving the land, like mm -hmm. you like to hear. Um, it was colonial um, financing it was out, out, and even like John F. Kennedy traveled to uh, Palestine in the 30s and noticed that this was causing a lot of tensions because you can get all this um, funding that is, and, and so like that, like you're right, is it's serving a particular class. And it's not lost on me that like, 
a leading capitalist in America, well, I mean, globally, Elon Musk, um, who is, I think, plausibly could be considered an anti-Semite, but also recently a confirmed Zionist, um, you know, in the long lineage of that duo, um, like he's taken a special interest in, uh, I think, calling uh, um certain Palestinian protests, um, pro-terror and that sort of stuff. Um, you've seen the um, uh, a bunch of billionaires uh, uh, got together and have doing these efforts against our university systems, saying mm -hmm. we need to call to task. Bill Ackman, um, uh, but he's not the only billionaire, but he's maybe the most public. Um, and so, yeah, like the the like David mentioned earlier, this is not a popular thing in America to the extent that people are learning more about it. But it is something that is financed heavily. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that you know it it, it is really important um, to to look, um, and I, I think this is uh, similar. You know, please please correct me and, and tell me what what your perspective is on this in Europe. Um, but you know, in, in America, I mean. You know, when you see the the statements that are coming out from American elected officials uh, on this, um, it is stark how out of touch it is uh, with the general American population. I mean, so some of the opinion pollings for American as as a whole are showing that fifty percent of Americans think that Israel has gone too far. Uh, this is from the AP. Um, it gets even higher. It's like 63 percent uh, for Democrats um, and even Republicans who, you know, for a lot of historic um, and political reasons, you would think, um, you know, would be much more supportive of Israel. Even that has seen a significant uptick in people who say Israel has gone to, you know, too far in, in, in the past few months. Um, and what's amazing about that is that like, OK, so you see, yes, in America, you know, there is a gradient of how people feel about this issue. Some people support what Israel is doing. Some people don't. Um, but you see the Democratic Party. Um, where now the vast majority of Democrats, people who identify as, as Democrats in the United States, are saying, we think what Israel is doing is wrong, and they have gone too far. Meanwhile, the elected officials from the Democratic Party are some of the harsh, most, sorry, some of the strongest hawks um, on this issue. It really does show this disconnect between, I don't know, popular opinion, popular will, um, and uh, government activity uh, that we have in the United States. And I know it's not unique to us. Um, you know, so when, when you talk about Israel-Palestine, um, you know, there's an aspect to this is like, yes, this is, uh, you know, a conflict in a specific part of the world. But very quickly, you see how it's very much attached to, you know, global capitalism, to American militarism, to the crisis of democracy in American politics. Um, and so it doesn't take too much digging on, on, on this issue to sort of see where, again, a particular conflict um, becomes very universal. And I will say that, like, one of the funniest tricks that we see out there uh, in, in this country is when people want to do everything other than talk about the material reality, right? So one thing you'll hear in America is like, oh, you know, people tell the story, you know, basically like, oh, well, there's this religion called Judaism, and then there's this religion called, uh, you know, Islam. And these two people don't get along. And for thousands of years, you know, there's been this or that conflict, right? right? And what are they trying to do there? It's trying to get us as far away from the present reality where there are millions of people who are effectively incarcerated on a strip of land that is being bombed by a settler colonialist project, right? Like, look, I'm not trying to say we should be ahistorical, not, you know, recognize any history, but it does become really interesting when you're so much more interested in trying to talk about, you know, things that happened a thousand, 1500 years ago uh, versus talking about what is happening like this week. Yeah, I just want to say that like that that's a big misconception that I feel like we have to remind people in the media is that as if this has just been um there's been nothing but um sec sec um uh you know conflict for thousands of years and you actually look at it and this is a product of a colonial structure there hasn't been any changes to any of the holy texts the torah or the quran have not undergone any changes in the uh 20th century what changed is colonialism yeah exactly and it, it's pretty funny to watch kind of uh, democratic i seen democratic party politicians who, you know, try to kind of use uh, whatever happened, for instance, in the in the US, um, like, they, they try to, you know, use whatever thing that happened that can kind of that they can act act as if they're defending or they they're right on or they, you know, they're yeah. seeking justice on. 
Um, but then it's horrible. On that note, there was this young lady um, who was in a panel, I think, on uh, CNN. And, you know, she's like, yeah, I would really uh, it's really difficult for me because I like was a Biden supporter um, and he's doing this in front of us. And the response to, from the reporter is like, well, do you not care about women's reproductive rights? And like that, people are going to react extremely negatively, I think, rightfully, when that is put, like because what it, what I think people are realizing is that when the Democratic Party sees something like. Roe versus Wade uh, get thrown out by a conservative Supreme Court and uh, abortion rights threatened, they look at it as, oh, we're going to get votes out of this. And unfortunately, like they see like, well, maybe we can we, we don't have to deliver on student loan um, uh, uh, forgiveness or we can support Israel even more than the standard Democratic president could even be expected to, which I would say, like, a lot of this stuff is, you know, determined by uh, capitalism and, and imperial structures. But Biden, as a personality, is extremely um, aggressive. Uh, when it comes from like previous presidents have at least rhetorically um, been a little bit more forceful in, in saying this stuff. But yeah, I'm curious what David has to say. Well, I mean, I just wanted to sort of add like another wrinkle to this um, for, for folks who might not have been, you know, might not be familiar. It's been going on in, in, in American politics on the progressive side for the past few years, um, which has been uh, organizations like the Democratic Majority for Israel has just been dumping millions upon millions of dollars into campaigns um, in, in the United States. And, you know, ostensibly by the name, you think that what they really care about is, uh, you know, Israel. And yes, they do uh, very much. You know, if, if a progressive candidate is running for office and says something, you know, about Palestinian dignity or something like that, you know that they're going to dump a lot of money into their opponent, be they Republican or Democrat. Um, but what's also interesting is the way um that this organization will sort of attack uh, uh, candidates. So it's not always like, oh, this person is not in line with our position on Israel. It will be things like, oh, this is like a kind of a tax raise and spend more liberal, right? This person's going to be bad at fiscal politics. This person uh, doesn't agree with you on guns, right? All sorts open of borders. other kind of stuff. Yeah, open borders. Um, uh, frankly, a lot of it is like very conservative, more right-wing uh, attacks. That has nothing to do uh, with Israel. Um, you know, so there's an aspect in American politics too that I think uh, we've been seeing. And I think, um, you know, we're talking to our, our friend Chip Gibbons uh, recently about this, where it's like, it has been frustrating to see some of the lack of spine from a lot of Democratic uh, Party officials. Um, and I'm not trying to sit here and celebrate easy victories. Um, but, you know, the fact that we have had members coming out and, and trying to lead the way and push for a ceasefire, I think shows a lot of the groundwork um, that the pro-Palestinian, the pro-human -pro rights movement in this country um, has been doing over the past few years. Because, you know, in 2010, um, I don't think we would have as many people calling for a ceasefire. Hell, you know, I'm I'm from Texas. I live in Texas. Uh, the Texas Democratic Party, which for people who don't know is like not in power, probably it's not going to be power for a long time, but still is a more conservative Democratic Party than most of the other parts of the state. They voted for a ceasefire um, and endorsed a ceasefire um, in December. The Texas AFL-CIO um, endorsed a ceasefire. Um, and the UAW, of course, very famously, um, and I think most influentially, um, called for one, right? So there's been a lot of groundwork, I think, to sort of push up against this. But I think it's an important wrinkle for people who might not be as familiar that, like, politically, even outside of the direct question of Israel-Palestine, um, organizations that have been set up around it have been playing an outsized role in American politics for a long while. Yeah, um, I think that should be pretty clear to anyone following uh, U.S. politics. But yeah, and, and I mean, going back to this kind of twisted use, I, I just find it incredible that, you know, this, the same politicians that would probably um, have this idea of, for instance, um, Native Americans as magic or, you know, that are like going on and on and on and on. And, and even, you know, just basically tokenizing and using people, um, for their own gain, then they say nothing about an actual ongoing project of mm. colonialism, right? Um, yeah. So well, it's especially egregious. I mean, with the with the with the uh, the word genocide being uh, mm. you know relevant internationally, and you know, I'm open to having an expansive uh, 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 view of that term. You know, 
be coming from the North Dakota um, in the middle of America, a product, uh, one of the states, a product of dispossession of Native Americans, and ethnic cleansing um, and genocide, frankly, um, that like we should be um, uh, have a clear uh, use of that term. And it should be a preventative one, uh, too, and not just a retrospective one. Um, and to see certain politicians um, ready to deploy it in the terms of uh, Ukraine and Russia and then having absolutely zero to say in that in that mm -hmm. um, when it comes to what Israel's doing and even suggesting that uh, invoking that term is uh, a, a degradation of the memory of the Holocaust, like really sick. Yeah. It's uh, completely sick. And um, going forward, we wanted to ask, um, as a sort of solution, I, I don't know if that's the right word because unfortunately it does seem very distant right now, but um, what specific shapes could the solidarity between the American and European as well, uh, working classes take that would effectively that would like be effective and useful um to palestine to gaza right now uh both right now in the immediacy of the yeah attempted genocide that we are witnessing in gaza but also long term to end the apartheid i mean um I'll expand on this, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's building power. It's, it's building power. And I know that sounds a little, you know, cute, but like, uh, seriously, that is sort of what it has, has to be because we've seen these impressive street mobilizations and they're important. Um, you know, but the real question is how do we take, you know, this kind of energy, this kind of mobilization, um, not just in the future and like longer term projects, but how can we utilize that, um, in an effective way to get, the people in power uh, to start responding, you know, to this crisis. Um, you know, in, in, in the United States, uh, the the kind of uh, democratic socialist uh, to progressive movement um, has been sort of suffering a lot in the past few years. Uh, the Biden years um, have seen, you know, significant declines in political mobilization for people in a lot of those organizations. Organizations like the Democratic Socialists of America, unfortunately, has seen uh, continued declining uh, membership uh, since Biden took power. Um, you know, uh, you know, so there's this kind of difficulty of, of mobilization. And yet, once uh, October 7th happened, once the bombing campaign against Gaza started, you started to see a lot more energy and mobilization. People who might have not participated in political activity in the United States in a long while are now showing up and, and, and tuning in and getting back involved. And um, that's a really good thing and an important thing. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves, learning from, you know, the left projects of the past 14 years, um, you know, is how do we take something like the street mobilizations, for example, that we're seeing and translate that into political movements, into organized uh, movements? Um, I don't want to sit here and, and, and make it seem, by the way, um, I'm not as familiar with what's going on in, in Europe in terms of the structure and organization of these things. Um, but in America, let's not pretend for a second that the street mobilizations are just happenstance or haven't been organized or, you know, no, these are things that have taken tremendous amounts of coordination. And I think, you know, the question is how can we mobilize and move people who are showing up to these activities uh, to be joining organizations like the Democratic Socialists of America to be continuing to do the work um, like for example we've been seeing in the union movement in America um, you know we have the United Auto Workers who just went off a massive strike um, against the big three auto companies here in America and uh, you know Matt and I you know we run our podcast on American politics and, and labor and we were sort of talking privately about how much we liked the leader of the UAW um, saying how nice it would be if he might say something, you know, off the cuff about Palestine, uh, not realizing that, you know, just a few days later that they were actually going to come out and, and strongly um, in, you know, push for a ceasefire. Like that is the kind of way to, I think, uh, you know, where our focus should be is how can we find ways uh, to get, you know, big organizations to actually the promise of socialist politics, the promise of progressive politics is that there's more people, there's more of us than there are elites right and our question should always be how can we actually mobilize and, and use people um you know motivate people to you know participate in politics uh, that can actually affect and, and and change outcomes for people like folks in in, in gaza um you know so that's like a i think a big question and i, I you know i i'll, I'll let matt go because i um 
I know I've been going on for a little bit because, you know, there's difficulties here too, though, because as the UAW did endorse a ceasefire a few weeks later, they also endorsed Joe Biden, um, you know, which is a difficult kind of thing to, to wrestle with. And again, shows, I think more than anything, um, the seriousness of, of, and, and, and the speed at which we really need to be mobilizing, um, and increasing power for the left. Yeah, I would just, I think, you know, the ICJ case, all that stuff is very interesting and promising. And, you know, we covered it with Chip, but that almost seems like more of a spectator thing, unless you're a lawyer, maybe, right? Um, but the, I think, you know, Palestinian, Jacobin has a good piece, um, mm -hmm. Jacobin Magazine, a global movement for union solidarity with Palestine is underway. And it points out that the Palestinian labor unions called for um, uh uh, ceasefire and uh, not stop arming Israel, <laughs> you know, not shouldn't be a difficult thing, uh, you know, and and um, that's where we need to see. And we had a uh, listener of ours from Japan uh, talk about the uh, student protests that led to one of their big trading firms uh, saying we're not going to work with Elbit Systems and I believe another defense contractor uh, uh, the, uh, with Israel. And you, I, you've seen all this all sorts. You've seen this happen on, at the grassroots level or at the union uh, uh, level in America and in Europe. And that stuff is it's extremely promising because like David said, like I you read about the UAW and how difficult Vietnam was um, to, to take a stance on and, and that sort of thing. And then you have not only Sean Fain, the leader of the UAW, but up and coming um, leaders in that group that pushed that forward. And, you know, like you said, like it's always kind of one step forward, uh, steps back in the American electoral system um, because there's not really like it'd be nice if Republicans would conceivably you know i don't know there's no way nice that there's a political party or organization in this country right. that was actually taking the position um of you know human rights for for palestinians or even help <laughs> taking the position of the vast majority of, of democratic voters um but right. we don't get that and you know yeah it's it's a very difficult but kind the best of... defense of biden with regards to gaza is that uh trump will be even more genocide -y. like that's the best that they got right now and and I, I I'm not trying to be um, over the top here or anything like that. You know, you really have to actually ask yourself what that question, uh, what that would look like, because yeah. what Joe Biden has sort of rubber stamp, what Joe Biden has done as president of the United States during this moment, it's really yeah. hard to imagine how much worse it could get other than like actually like providing like direct military assistance in a bombing campaign. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not that I have any preference or dream or interest in Donald Trump being the president. Um, well, but yeah. I think that what like it's an extremely do? low bar to use, um, especially if the, if that's sort of being used to sort of silence criticism of Joe Biden to say, Oh, yeah. well, I think Trump might be worse. I mean, that's a really, really brutal bar. Uh, or brutal metric uh, to be trying to do. It's an unserious one almost. With. Yeah. 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 It is unserious. Uh, and yeah, I I fully agree. And I think uh, many people will uh, uh, made a DM in general, probably uh, political parties, political organizations, and unions are basically the way that we get out of this. Um, I, I wonder also, I, I don't want people to misunderstand this, but I think often about how the problems that we have uh, and that workers have everywhere um, are kind of a tiny part of what Palestinians go through on a kind of times infinite, right? Uh, so for instance, you know, uh, you see, for example, in the UK, there's this massive uh, cost of living crisis and you see people, um, you know, living in these um, mold infested apartments. They can't breathe. They, they basically, fundamentally, they have huge housing issues, right? Uh, they have to give up meals. Uh, you know, they have to give up electricity. Uh, in Madrid also, we've had... Uh, a horrific case of that in the um, southern part of the city. There's this neighborhood that had power cut for uh, such a long time already. Uh, it's it's insane. And these people are living, you know, in, in these extremely precarious housing situations and also without power, uh, without any sort of cleanliness. And, you know, much like in the UK, uh, in, in the region of Madrid, also healthcare 
is really hard to access uh, in the sense that the system is collapsing. And I don't know, I think about Gaza and, and pal Palestinians' um, lives in general, and it's that, like I said, multiplied by, mm -hmm. you know, I can't even find a number. It's, it's way worse. But the root of the problem uh, seems to be there. And I don't know, uh, do you guys think that this sort of, you know, also maybe for Southern Europeans linking it to maybe the fact that you have to leave your homeland, like your home, basically, uh, that you should have, shouldn't you have a right to stay in your own home? Um, I don't know. I, I feel like instead of uh, dwelling on the insurmountable, supposedly insurmountable differences uh, between us, shouldn't we be trying to make, like you said, these people that are organizing, that are, um, you know, really on the streets for Palestine right now, shouldn't we maybe try to, like, do you guys think this is also a part of it? Like saying our problems have the same root. Uh, obviously the, the spectrum is wide, mm -hmm. but don't we have more, don't, don't we have the same needs? Because isn't that kind of a big point? at the end of the day, right? I think part of it is, yeah, um, it goes toward just overcoming a massive level of dehumanization of Palestinians mm. that, uh, you know, I think we've experienced um, as members of the West and increasingly... I I feel so sad at like the amount of times you look at the, we, we watch some old videos of Edward Said um, making appearances on US media and the amount of racism that he was treated with as if he mm. was like carrying a bomb into the studio and like everybody should be on edge because this guy might get violent, you know, in defense of Palestine or something like that. And that's just happened to basically every Palestinian voice is they're, they're immediately treated with the utmost suspicion um, and not as people and not as uh, people that are suffering and need actually our help. <laughs> you know, not just our indifference um, or lack of hatred, but like we need they need us to help stop our political system from uh, arming the, the people that are oppressing them. And we've I think one of the reasons you see the poll results you do in America, where at least I mean, across the aisle, frankly, people are more willing to say, actually, I'm not comfortable with Israel's uh, uh, the destruction Israel's wreaking there is because. I think we have seen Edward Said uh, and television and then the internet, like that broke a seal where it wasn't just seen in text, like these pe th this bombing happened. Um, it is, you know, people suffering. And I mean, I'll just, as a news producer, I've seen some of the worst things I've ever seen in my life mm -hmm. um, mediated through uh, what's been going on in Gaza through the internet. Um, and it is people. It's people suffering. It's, uh, the, you know, universities. It's people just aren't going to buy that. Every, all those universities and hospitals and bakeries bombed are terror, are terrorist cells. People just, you know, maybe in, in a pr more propagandistic media age uh, or more controlled or something that would fly. But people can see it with their own, uh, despite the amount of journalists who are being targeted for killing uh, uh, in Gaza, um, people can see it. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, on that level, Matt, like, I think the, the ability of people to see what's going on, I think, has 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 created a situation where a lot of people are sort of revisiting uh, not just their positions on Israel-Palestine, um, but also just like a lot of those kind of like fundamental truths about politics or the world. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's it's just something that's just undeniable if you've watched. Uh, yeah, if you see the videos of of a mother, you know, holding their dead child and saying, I wasn't able to feed them breakfast, you know what I mean? Just like some of the most human uh, things, you know, you'll ever see, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's incredibly, you know, moving and, and, and should be mobilizing um, <clears throat> for folks. But to go back to your, your question about, you know, connecting these things, um, you know, I think like at the end of the day, like, what I'm, what we're seeing right now, particularly with the street mobilizations um, in in the U.S., you know, it, it obviously is making me think about the big Black Lives Matter protests that we saw a few years back, um, or also Occupy. Um, I do think, as somebody who's participated in in all three of those, um, these mobilizations around Palestine seem to have the most kind of uh, 
groups on the ground, people like organizations that are sort of or putting these things together, then some of the other uh, marches or, or, or things that are participated in. Um, but um, going back to both Occupy and Black Lives Matter, I think one of the things that is worrying to me, and I think one of the big questions that we have to figure out is to move from protest into politics, right? Um, and, and figure out a way to sort of mobilize these things. And to go back to your question about, you know, connecting what's happening in Palestine with people's everyday lives. Um, you know, I don't even think you need to do that in the sense of saying, you know, like well, people make this example, for example, for, in the U.S., for example, is that Palestinians are abused by the police, just like poor and working class and, and black folks are. Right. And I think that's a correct and fine point to make. Um, but I think even larger than that, what we have to recognize, I think, at this point is that there really is only one kind of political or orientation or organization uh, that is going to take on. Uh, you know, the issues of dispossession of people in wherever where you live, not being able to afford to live in their community and also abroad Palestinians. And that's going to be a working class movement that's going to take on capitalism, that's going to take on um, imperialism. Um, and I think that one thing that is absolutely critical, actually, is for us not to do something that we do a lot in the U.S. left is sort of compartmentalize politics. Right. Um, and, and, and be like, okay, well, this is our anti-imperial work. It's like, no, you know, if, if you are out there recruiting and talking to people, you also should be talking about how, Hey, yeah, it's getting harder and harder to live in your city. I mean, I've been reading a lot about rural American voters and, you know, some of these statistics that you read, um, you know, are, are, are horrifying and particularly just on people's view of their life. And, and most people will say things like, I think my children will have a worse life than I do. I mean, that is becoming, you know, a, a, an unfortunate, almost universal category for, for workers. And don't get me wrong, there are massively different degrees of what that worst life looks like from somebody who might live in a rural America who's having a hard time getting a job versus somebody in Gaza who might not even have a t the, the place that they're from anymore. But what I'm saying is that, like, there is only one kind of political organization, political movement that is going to be able to do something for that. And that's going to be a working class politics both to fight at home and abroad. And I think that when we see these mobilizations that we're seeing, we have to be able um, you know, to, yes, have our eyes on Gaza, have our eyes on Palestine, um, but also know that the only way that we'll be able to really effectively help that um, is by actually building up a strong working class left in, in the United States and in Europe. Um, and I think that's sort of you know where, where, where we're at, where we have to be thinking about politics right now. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, basically, I I want people to yeah stay with that and and that's what we're trying to do here. And that's I think what you guys uh, really analyze and you know look at yeah what why why it's the <laughs> the way to go basically. <laughs> and yeah, and I thank you for that. And thank you so much for for talking to us about you know, something that you obviously know a lot about uh, firsthand um, from the U.S. And thank you for all of your work. Um, we will keep watching and we hope uh, people who watch us do too. Thank you so much. Likewise. Guys. Thank, thank you. you.